Hello everybody, Courtney here, and I said that I would come on and do two videos comparing the Dave Ramsey Baby Steps to the Pillars of Financial Independence. And for inspiration, there is an article called The Pillars of Financial Independence on the Choose FI podcast website. So if you want to Google Choose FI, I will try to remember to link that below. So be patient with me as I do that, and I will try to link any resources I talk about below here too. I want to take a minute and ask you to please subscribe and like this video if you like it. I am not monetized at this time. I'm very close. I don't really do this to make money, but it would be nice <laughs> because it does take a lot of work. And while I do this more of a public service, um, I sure appreciate your support. And if I could get monetized, it will get the message out there to more people. So the tenets of financial independence compared to the baby steps. The baby steps are great for people who are just just discovering, oh gosh, I don't want to be like rest of America and not have money to live on. I don't want to live paycheck to paycheck. And the ba Dave Ramsey's baby steps are great for when you're trying to get out of debt, you're trying to change your mindset, you're trying to learn to live debt free because it takes that habit building and that intensity to build these habits that become normal after that. Now for us, um, I had been raised by depression era grandparents. My family was, um, a, a lot of them were entrepreneurs or in finance. So a lot of these things I kind of picked up naturally and it made it, I wouldn't say easier for me, but I did go through bankruptcy at the age of 22 um, due to, in the span of a year, I got divorced, had a stillborn baby with no health insurance, and had a car accident that caught in my I didn't lose my job because of the car accident, but my bosses got divorced and my job went away and I had a car accident all in the same month and got divorced and then within a year later uh, met someone else and got pregnant, well it was in the span of about eight, 18 months and had a stillborn baby and so I was doing really well, working two jobs, making honestly <laughs> the most money I ever made until I turned in my 40s, um, and that was at the age of 20, like 20, 21, and uh, yeah, it threw me into bankruptcy. I really didn't know another way. I thought I was good with money, and it was a real big hit to my ego, but one thing I told myself at that time was I will never be in this shape again, and while I never got to bankruptcy, I did marry someone who had very different money values than me, and we were married for 20 years. Uh, we got married right before my 21st birthday, and we got divorced right before my 41st birthday. And so it was a rough go. Um, we had four kids. We never, we did make good money by the end. We were making nearly 90,000 a year. But for most of our marriage, we were making around 30, anywhere from 17 to mid 30s. It wasn't until our late 30s that we started making over 60,000 before taxes with four kids. So it was rough and we lived paycheck to paycheck. We didn't get into terrible debt by today's standards, but we always struggled and um, we used the baby steps on several occasions to get out of debt and we had kind of that background that kept us kind of afloat, but never in a good space. And one thing I learned through doing all of that was People have different levels of tolerance for how comfortable they are for what I call living on the edge. And so living on the edge to me is how comfortable are you? How much money do you need to have in the bank before you feel nervous? And for me, it's quite a lot by some standards because I like that feeling of security. I like to know that my bills are paid, that I'm not going to be homeless, <laughs> um, and that I can help take care of anything that comes along. So in the baby steps we taught in my last video, we talked about the seven baby steps. Now we're moving on to the pillars of financial independence. I knew from the baby steps and from all my reading in the past, Your Money or Your Life, um, all the different books I had read, that in order to be retired early, I knew at 29 I wanted to retire at 55, um, that I needed to be debt free, make my wants few, uh, have a large emergency fund, and so I knew that. What I never understood was the investing part. We did invest into our 401k enough to get the match. My 
ex-husband and I both worked in public education and while we didn't have a pension we had a because we worked in higher education I was an adjunct instructor for 10 years and he was um, an administrator and I was a fitness adjunct so I worked for health sciences and so we did not make a ton of money but the 401k was available to him and it was really good and so it was like a seven percent match it went up it started at four went up to seven so we were always doing at least enough to get the match never more okay um and the match kind of ended up like working out where it matched his raises so every time they would increase the match it matched his raises so by the time we divorced we had been investing from the age of 29 for me 30 or 31 for him to the age of 40 so about 10 10 to 11 years and so it had done pretty well in the grand scheme of things but really from what i know now about index fund investing not so much so I had that and I had some debt and I'm not going to go into too much of my backstory. You can look at old videos, but I discovered the tenants of financial independence around 2017. It is now 2023 and we are financially independent, meaning my husband now and I went from broke to we have enough money to live the rest of our lives comfortably now without ever working again, though my husband does still work and I work for his business and for um our roofing business and for our Airbnb. So the first one is low cost housing. So what we did was I had a house when we met that I owned that was about 1200 and something dollars a month and we ended up selling that and we built this house and we did not take out any more of a loan on this house than I had. So as a single mama I had a loan for around 200,000 and when we got married we built this house for 218,000 our income over the years doubled from what it was at when I was single as a double income and we paid this house off in four years so that big pivotal moment was that we built less house than the bank said we could afford we did not increase our living we did buy a 40 acre farm, but we got in at a really good deal and got a really good deal on it. We only paid 120,000 for 40 acres outside of a national park area. And um, it's probably tripled that over the years, which has definitely helped our net worth. I'm not gonna lie, but we've also saved significantly as well. That in itself does not give us income except for the Airbnb but it definitely helps our bottom line. So one thing you can do is you can downsize. So our kids all grew up and we did not ex we did not expand our living. The house we built is very modest. It is a four bedroom. If you count the office, two and a half bath. Is that right? Yeah, two and a half bath. And um, it's 1,779 square feet and I was in 2,600 square feet. So technically we downsized. Um, you can downsize, you can, I mean, I just saw a guy I went to high school with and he is married and their house looks like it's like 5,000 square feet. The, I, my brain does not compute, but I try to tell myself like maybe they have a lot of family that comes to visit, grandkids, I don't know their situation, so I'm trying not to be judgmental, but I see that a lot. I see people living in these gargantuan houses with two people and that is killing some people who are living paycheck to paycheck okay low cost cars so i am on the fence about buying a newer car when my husband leaves his day job and we're just running the roofing business my husband is in law enforcement and he wants to stay the rest of the year to increase his pension and because of our health insurance however we have had we have low cost cars we our cars are 10 to 15 years old that was intentional we buy low mileage cars that have a good um, history they've been taken care of um, what we do and we're very patient i would say patience is the key when we hear about someone selling a car or we know that we're going to buy a car we put feelers out like i'll go on to facebook and say hey we're looking for a truck and if anybody has a low a truck that has low mileage, it's been well cared for, let me know. We really weren't looking for a Chevrolet, but we are so happy with our Chevrolet. Um, it wasn't a brand that we honestly would have thought to buy, but it's been a great truck. And so anyway, 
putting feelers out, being patient, being prepared, having the money saved up, knowing what you're looking for. And if you are not able, this is what I've gotten my kids to do, if you are not able to pay cash for a car, buying a car that fits your needs that's not too expensive that you can pay off earlier rather than later. The next thing is crushing your grocery budget. So when you don't know what else to do, stop eating out so much. Cutting your grocery budget by 10% is pretty easy. You hardly feel that at all. Um, you can just try to cut out the more expensive things like meat, eggs, and dairy. So I don't eat those things, but they are definitely more expensive. Doing more plant-based meals with whole foods is a lot cheaper. Rice and bean meals. There's great ways like rice and black beans and mango and like a salad is so delicious with a squeeze of lime on top. I do uh, vegan chili, uh, beans and cornbread, split pea soup and bread. Today I'm making baked potatoes and sweet potatoes. The baked potatoes will have broccoli or chili on top with my vegan homemade cheese sauce, which is made from carrots, potato, cauliflower, and cashews. Um, oatmeal for breakfast is like 25 cents. Look online, there are so many great YouTube videos for how to eat on a budget for $50 a week for a family of four. Our daily expenses for eating are $9 to $11 a person, which is kind of high. And that includes like some more expensive things that we like, like organic, but I definitely could get it even cheaper if I wanted to. But crushing your grocery bill, your top three expenses are going, unless you have a lot of debt, credit card consumer debt are going to be housing, car, and food. So those are the things when you have the opportunity to change, change. Food is the easiest because everybody can do that today. Housing and cars, those are kind of more pivotal moments. The next one I want to talk about, and I'm not going to go into too much depth because you can definitely look these up online, is college hacking. Again, the, I'm telling you what we did. Four kids, my husband had two, one was already grown. Our kids all went to community college for free. Now, because I and my ex-husband worked there, my kids could have gone for free, um, and they did. But they also, a couple of them went through programs that were corresponding while they were last part of high school. They could either do technical college and get out with a technical certificate, um, and all my kids did that. And so, or they could do AP classes and get their first year of college. So. My middle daughter and son both graduated in one year with their associate's degree for free. They also, because I was low income, they got a Pell Grant and scholarships because their grades were good that helped them live and pay for their car insurance, phone, gas, and living expenses while they were in college. Um, there are so many ways to college hack from choosing a cheaper college, your first two years at community college, working for the college, taking out Pell Grants, making sure that your kids are going for something that they can actually get, in a, get a job in, and starting early to talk to your kids about education and not really pressuring them to do go straight into college if they're not ready, just kind of guiding them. Because in this day and age, college isn't the answer for everyone. I have uh, two associate degrees and a technical certification and then a whole, whole bunch of certifications in my field. And I hardly worked in the field that I got my degrees in, which is early childhood education, and I certainly didn't make any money. The next one is, um, now, if you're going, like my son uh, has a degree, he has to have a master's degree in counseling to be a therapist, and that's he's probably going to get out with nearly $100,000 in debt, which I hate. Um, but that includes the fact that his first two years in college were paid for. So you want to do what you can to not go out with a lot of credit, a lot of debt for college. The next one is travel rewards. I heard a, my first nightmare story yesterday about this. I've been really simple about this. I use the Chase Ch Sapphire Preferred, and I did the Hilton Honors. Though I am, I've had some problems with Hilton. Um, where you just get the card, you put like 3000 on it the first six months, only buy what you already buy. Like if you know you're going to have to go buy a washer and dryer, get the car, buy the washer and dryer, pay it off, only travel hack and get credit cards with the bonuses if you know you can pay them off every month. Now, I've done this. It's helped me immensely, but these are just cashback bonuses. I only recommend travel hacking if you know 
that you have a good history with paying your cards off every month and you already have the money in the bank and you're not going to spend more because you have a credit card because technically people spend more when they use a credit card. This is for those who are already debt free. The next one is cut the cable. Cut the expensive phone bills, get a Roku, um, manage your subscriptions. So we do Roku, we have Netflix, Prime, and right now Apple TV. We kind of toggle our, our subscriptions to whatever we're watching and cancel them when we're not using them. Um, cable was like 120 when we cut the cord. I didn't have it until I got married. My husband had it and he learned very quickly that it's a huge waste of money. We now spend around $30 a month for subscriptions. Um, it's so ridiculous if you have cable. I mean, you can just have a subscription for a fourth of that. And there's so much even free on TV, like Tubi and um, Roku channels. And then just even going to the library and getting DVDs, videos, and books. The next one is the phone. If you haven't gotten rid of AT&T or Verizon yet, you just basically, you shouldn't be paying more than $55 a month for cell phone service. That's the highest tier with Straight Talk. I know Mint, we don't have good service with Mint where we live, but Mint has a great plan for $15 a month. The kicker is you got to pay three months at a time, but for that price, totally worth it. Um, so if you haven't, I've been with Straight Talk for 11 years now, and I've had no problems whatsoever. We pay $55 a month. My son is on a plan that helps, he gets, he pays 35 a month. It's been great. If we get a, uh, once we close our businesses and retire, I'm looking at some different cheaper plans, but right now we need a high amount of data. Okay, the next one is you wanna increase your savings rate. So once you're debt free, let's say your, your debts were about $600 a month, you're gonna transfer that into savings every month. So you want to increase your savings rate. I started out with a very small savings rate when I got divorced and I've slowly, we've slowly increased that as we paid off our debts, we started saving more, paid off our house, saving more, and now we're at a 70% savings rate, which I know is really, really high, but it didn't happen overnight. It was a, you learn these things and then when you have the inflection points in your life, you adopt them. So as we paid off the house, that twelve hundred something dollars a month started going into investments. Um, as we, you know, got our debts paid off, we cash flowed building this house so that we didn't owe a lot on the house, and we were able to pay it. And as we've increased our income, we have increased what we save every month. All right, the next one: low cost index fund investing. Whew. Read The Simple Path to Wealth. Um, listen to Mr. Money Mustache. I'm going to try to remember to put all these down below. There is an article called the something like The Easy Math to Early Retirement or something like that. I'll try to find it and put it down below. Um, you basically take the amount of money you think you're going to need, your bare bones budget in retirement, and you times that four times 25. If you're older like I am, and I know many of my watchers are over 40, um, we backed out our social security and pension. So if you think I need $40,000 a year, then you're gonna need 40 times 25 is a million, okay? There's this thing called the 4% rule. 4% of the amount you have invested will give you the amount of money that you'll have in your retirement. We don't need a million because we have the Social Security and pension, which is about three thousand a month. I, early on, I thought all we needed was thirty-six thousand, but with inflation, I'm trying to get it up to about sixty now. So for us, we need about a half a million. And I will tell you that once you hit your first one hundred thousand, it goes really fast. But here's the thing: don't get overwhelmed by these huge numbers, especially if you're a low earner. If you keep your expenses low, you're debt free. Now my mom lives on social security and that's all she has, $2,100 a month. That is enough for her. If she, if she especially had her house paid off, that would really be enough for her. You do not need a lot if you don't have any debt, you don't have a mortgage, and your needs are few. You can take advantage of free things. 
So the Simple Path to Wealth explains this in detail, and I'll leave a link below. For us, I didn't. My husband didn't have a retirement account until a few years ago, and he will be 65 this weekend. So for him, I've been dumping all of our extra money in his account and my account, getting that up there, and he will be retiring completely around 68 or 69. He's in really good health and in shape, but we're trying to enjoy life now too because he is getting older. The next thing is to side hustle and increase your income. That is what we did. My husband worked in law enforcement and he had a side construction job where he did side work. His job, he's basically on duty about 14 days a month. So he was doing building fences, decks, and roofs. We expanded that business when we got married and that's grown into a full-time business for us. And so we are able to live on about $48,000 a year and that's extravagant. That's going on vacations. That's paying cash for everything. We want for nothing, but we don't live an extravagant lifestyle, but it feels extravagant to us. Um, but I worked multiple jobs while we were getting out of debt and increasing, and I never left one job until we reached a goal. So like I would say, okay, when we save a year's worth of income, I'm going to quit teaching weekend and night classes. And that's what I would do. When we pay off our house, I'm going to leave my day job and just help my husband and his business. And that's what I did. So, what, And I think that was the key to me staying motivated because I always had a goal. And y'all, sometimes it would take me three years. I had a school. I traveled around for 10 years teaching yoga teachers. I worked 28 days a month. Oh my gosh, from 2011 or 2008 to 2019, I worked 28 days a month teaching yoga. And I was on the road all the time. I was able to be home in the evening when my kids were out of school and every other weekend when they weren't with their dad. And I was able to um, get to a point by 2019 where I said, I will close my school once I have this much money saved, all our debts were paid off, um, a certain amount was saved. And then this year in 20, well last year in 2022, when we paid off our house and we reached a certain financial milestone, I was able to leave my day job just to help my husband. So it would take me like three or four years to reach that goal, but I always kept it inside and I hit it. But it's the slog, it's not fast. So just because I'm sitting here today telling you this doesn't mean it was easy or fast. The next one is to increase your income. I just said that. Um, my husband and I, he, he's been with his job. He's gotten a raise every year, which has been great. Um, he also, we've as we've gotten known in the roofing business, because we have a good reputation, it has snowballed and it has grown every year. And as it has grown, we just haven't increased our lifestyle. So we have that 70% savings rate, but we only live off the 48,000 and the rest we save and invest. Um, and then the last one I'd like to say is called smart spending. I'll give you an example. So let's say you wanna get in shape and you can go to a gym and it's $27 a month or free if you're over 65. And instead of hiring a personal trainer, you take classes three times a week. This is actually something my mom and I are dealing with. So a personal trainer might cost you a certain amount, but to take classes for free or to get books, you go to the library. I got three books from the library yesterday. Or I go to like Walmart and I look at the clearance aisle and I stock up on things there that I use when they're on clearance. I know when things get marked down. So yesterday I use a lot of those contact strips. You can see in my house, my house is all wood. Um, I don't want to put nails in the wall. They had a whole bunch of them marked down to like $1.53 yesterday. So I will buy what I use on clearance and stock up. Um, I always think about, do I need this? I sell my clothes when I'm not, when we don't uh, use them. I do things like our entertainment is generally free. Um, we save up for vacations and I uh, have a budget for those. Smart spending means not going into debt, spending money on things you value, saving on things you, you don't value as much <laughs> or they don't mean as much to you. They don't really move the needle. So. One example of this is I don't feel like us living in a bigger house 
would make me any happier. I don't feel like me having a brand new car would make me any happier. I am looking at upgrading my car when my husband retires because we have three now. We have to have a big work truck. Then we have a car he drives when he's not using the work truck and we have my car. We're looking at making a change down to two cars when he leaves his police job. But I will think strategically and it will be a car that will be very affordable that we can pay cash for. I'm always thinking like Yes, I could go out and pay cash for a Mercedes-Benz, but I probably end up buying a RAV4, <laughs> used RAV4, or a used CRB or something like that that I can pay cash for and keep the rest of that money. Like, you might could be able to afford a $100,000 car, but instead you go buy a $25,000 used car that's very nice, that serves all your needs, and um, or even at this point right now, none of our cars, our work truck cost twenty thousand. My car was twelve thousand, and our extra car that he drives when he's not using the work truck was seventy five hundred. And so we just maintain and keep those cars. We don't like we go to matinees instead of expensive movie nights. We go to mid range movies. Um, like we always think about how can I do get this same thing but pay less for it. And so that's what smart spending is. This has been a rather long video, but I hope it's been helpful. Thank you so much for being here. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.